My name is Max. I'm a Swedish medical student um, from Lund University. And I'm here in Sydney doing a short research project as part of my medical degree. Um, I'm delighted for the opportunity to speak here for you today. And I hope that I will be able to provide you with some insight in the difficulties of translating animal work into the clinical practice. So we have a pointer here, yeah? This works? Oh. So, everything works in animals and nothing works in humans. It's kind of the feeling you get sometimes. You hear about a groundbreaking story about a treatment that's been proven successful in an animal model. It can be the most amazing things. Target therapies for cancer that are supposed to eradicate all kinds of cancer. Stem cell therapies with the most amazing results. But the problem is, quite often it just goes away and you don't hear about it anymore. So what happens? Well, in 2006, O. Collins published a paper saying that 1,026 therapies had been, had been tested in experimental models of stroke. Now, more than 500 of these interventions was actually proven to be efficacious in animals, and <coughs> one reached the clinic, and that was the TPA thrombolysis. So I know that animals, animals differ from us, obviously, uh, and we'll never get up to 100% in translation rate. But one in, five, one in 500 is a really low number, especially considering the amount of genes that we actually share with our fellow vertebrates. Now with that being said, animal studies have been and still are an invaluable tool for bringing treatments into the clinic. So what if you could better guess which potential treatments could be of benefit to humans? What if we could focus our resources and efforts on those studies, actually maximizing the chance getting out a clinically relevant therapy? So that's a part of what the Camarades do. And Camarades is an acronym for Collaborative Approach to Meta-Analysis and Review of Animal Data from experiment, Experimental Studies. And it's a conglomerate of groups, with the original group working out of Edinburgh, but with collaborat collaborators in the US, Canada, Netherlands, and here in Australia, actually. Uh, I'm currently working on a project with a group from Edinburgh. And they started working in 2004 with experimental models of stroke, but they have expanded to other areas since. And how Camarades goes about this is with the concept of systematic reviews and meta-analysis. The majority of you have probably already heard the term, and a lot of you know what it is and how it works. But when I started working with this a couple of months ago, I kind of didn't. So I just want to take a few minutes to introduce the concept to you, even though I'd say I'm, I am by no means any kind of expert in this field. So a systematic review is a method for objectively, objectively and transparently assessing a field of interest. Now it differs from a classic narrative review where an expert in the field includes studies that he or she finds important, summarizes the results, and then draws conclusions based on this. In a systematic re review, however, it is pre-specified in a protocol <coughs> what studies are going to be included and how they will be looked at. So this is specified via, for example, a search strategy inclusion and exclusion criteria, and what data points to be extracted from the study. Now this reduces the risk of bias, as all of the studies fulfilling these criteria have to be included and reviewed, and none other can be. With that being said, as somebody's actually writing up the protocol, it's never going to be completely objective and unbiased, but the mechanism, mechanisms of reviewing are transparent. Now, Narrative reviews still play an important part in scientific journalism, but they are two different things and should be regarded accordingly. Lastly, the results of a systematic review are often synthesized in a meta-analysis. Now, we've seen a few pictures of this from before, but sometimes it's kind of hard to interpret. But a meta-analysis is a statistical tool for summarizing multiple studies investigating the same <laughs> research question. So in this example, we have a meta-analysis showing four studies that are investigating the impact of statin dose on the risk of death and myocardial infarction. So for every study, an effect size is calculated, and that's presented here as a risk ratio. Then a relative weight is assigned to all of the studies, and this relative weight is based mostly on two things. The first one being sample size, relatively indicated by the size of the square here. 
And the second measurement is precision, indica indicated by the 95% confidence interval. Then a summary effect is computed. And this summary effect is based on the individual effect sizes while still accounting for study weight. Now, as you can see, you can gain a lot of statistical muscle or power by using a meta-analysis. Three of the studies here actually don't reach statistical significance and have a p-value over 0.05. But when they are combined and computed in a meta-analysis, meta they can yield clear and convincing results. So in this case, a summary effect of 0.85 and a p-value of 0.000. And I don't know how long that goes on, but it's usually a lot of zeros. So it's a good method. <laughs> Systematic reviews and meta-analysis, they, they've been used a long time for RCTs, and many of the bigger and more impacting ones have been written by the so-called Cochrane Collaborative. It is not until quite recently, however, that we started using this for animal models, but it works just as well. So systematic reviews and meta-analysis of animal models can be used in multiple settings. It can be used, as in this example I just showed you, to answer the question, is there an effect to this intervention? But it can also be, shown, be used to assess the importance of factors within the treatment. You can look at the therapeutic window, the optimal dose, or the method of drug delivery. You can also use it to critically assess the literature for quality and risk of bias. And the third example is that you can use it to compare different putative treatments, suggesting which ones to move forward with and focus resources on. Now, all of these, these things can combine to provide valuable information for the design of future, both preclinical and clinical studies. So we're actually going to look at a couple of examples, starting with the first one here, Importance fa important factors within a treatment. So this is a meta-analysis from 2004 by McLeod et Altra. They're looking at a neuroprotector in animal stroke models called nicotinamide, and they wanted to see what factors seemed important for future work. So here they look at time, uh, sorry, dose and time to treatment. And as you can see in the left picture, a stratification for dose, every line is not a separate study anymore. Every line is the combined animal groups for the respective conditions. So the effect size here is actually significant when using a dose between 100 and 750 milligrams per kilogram. In the right picture, you see that stratification of time to treatment and the therapeutic window seems to be between more than one hour, but less than six hours after insult. So this information could definitely be used when designing new studies in the research of nicotinamide. A second example was that you can try to critically assess the literature for quality and risk of bias. This is a meta-analysis from 2008, also by McLeod et Altra. Here they were looking at another neuroprotector, also in experimental models of stroke. But the way, what they could also see was that the lack of reporting randomization and group allocation concealment in the studies actually inflated the effect size. So this is stratifications for randomized versus non-randomized studies. So there's no other difference between the studies. And the same goes for the right picture. And as you can see, the effect size is quite significantly inflated or increased. And the same has actually been shown for failing to report a blinded outcome assessment as well in separate reports. And all of these results are pretty similar to what has been seen for RCTs when failing to fulfill these criteria. It suggests an introduction of detection and selection bias in preclinical studies just as in clinical ones. So if these factors do matter for quality and risk of bias, how do studies report on them? Well, this is from a study in 2015 where Camarades McLeod et Altra, again, uh, did a random generation of animal studies from PubMed. So they did a search for primary research articles of animal models. And here they're presenting, I don't know if you can see that, but they're presenting the prevalence of reporting of different factors. So it's the conflict of interest, randomization, and a blinded assessment of outcome. Now, as you can see, do we have a pointer on here? That's a pointer. Oh, the reporting of a conflict of interest increased quite drastically here. So this is also shown over time from 1941 up until 2012. The reporting of a conflict of interest increased drastically. And this is believed to be largely due to journals actually starting to mandate this for publication. The rate of reporting randomization is also increasing 
albeit a bit more slowly, reaching around 30-35% between 2008 and 2012. Now the blinded assessment outcome, however, is not increasing by as much and it was still simmering around on less than 10% between 2000, 2008 and 2012. So I think this shows quite clearly the power that scientific journals could have in improving study quality. And they could do this by actually mandating other information being, being supplied as well, not just a conflict, a conflict of interest. So the third example was that you compare, can compare different putative treatments suggesting which work to move forward with. And this is a, it's a kind of cluttery picture, but I'll, I'll walk you through it. And it's a meta-analysis by Vesterine et al. From 2010, and it shows exper experimental treatments in animal models of multiple sclerosis. And the chart shows the 36 treatments that had been used in at least five experiments. Now the only thing I want to show with this picture is that it might make more sense taking linamide and FTY720 here in the red box forward for future research than choosing something with much less evidence here. So we have a positive effect size to the right and a negative to the left. And so it might be quite clear that these are possibly good candidates to work with, but it might actually take a study to show this. So that was the last example, and I've actually avoided the specifics of my project here in Sydney so far, but it involves hypothermia and TBI that we heard a bit about. And hypothermia has been used for TBI on and off for decades, most often, at least recently, in a moderate fashion. But it is subjected to a lot of conflicting results. And in 2009, a Cochrane review actually concluded that hypothermia should not be used except in the context of a high-quality randomized control trial with good allocation concealment. This review looked at 23 RCTs, <coughs> including around 1,600 patients. Now this last line I stole from Manush, and he mentioned it earlier, earlier as well. And it's the view of many, I think, that the evidence of hypothermia being beneficial in animal models of TBI appear compelling. But we're, af we're actually assessing if that's the case. So we're conducting a systematic review and meta-analysis of experimental models for TBI, hypothermia and TBI. So our inclusion criteria are here to, are here to the left. So we want animals and we want non-penetrating trauma. We're predominantly looking at systemic hypothermia, but focal hypothermia will actually be included in the numbers I show here, so have that in mind. Uh, we want a control group in the same study, and we want studies to report enough data so we can get up some quantitative results. Lastly, we're looking at a lot of different outcomes. So as you see, we have neuro behavior, ICP, contusion size, mortality, and so on. So the full text screening yielded 127 papers, but we've excluded 50, mostly due to pre-trauma cooling or non-sufficient reporting. We have 77 papers, left, le 77 papers left, and we're doing the data extraction all in duplicates, but we're still waiting for full duplication, so these all of these numbers will be from one assessor only, and that's my data. Um, so have that in mind, the results are preliminary and it might change. So what we've done so far is that we've assessed these papers for quality and risk of bias. And we've used a scale for this. So this is a scale that the Camarades has set up. And a few items you recognize from before, and these are in bold here. So, We've also added other items that we believe are markers for good quality and that reduces the risk of bias. A few of the items you see are pretty much analogs to quality markers for an RCT. Explanation of exclusions, numbers treated, and so on. The last items are probably more specific for animal research or TBI with the compliance of welfare regulation, animal regulations, and use of an anesthetic that doesn't have a neuroprotective activity. So what we've used is we've made up a composite score with every item yielding one point to the scale. And we've also assessed the items separately and in different combinations. So this is what it looks like so far. And again, emphasizing it's a part of the quality and risk of bias assessment and that the results are prelimi preliminary. But 43% of the papers report doing a random randomization for the animals. 27% report a blinded outcome assessment. And only 25% of the papers report doing both these items. We've seen zero sample size calculations and zero concealed group allocations. 
this is this dispersion of the quality score here to the, to the right. And as you can see, the majority score five or less on the scale. Now, despite this, it actually looks, the wriggle looks better than the random generation that Camarades did from PubMed. But I still believe that there's a lot of improvement in this regard. Now, except this assess assessment for quality and risk of bias, we're also, also going to look at the risk of publication bias using so-called funnel plots. And of course, also assessing the different outcomes using a lot of different stratifications. In the end, we actually hope that we might be able to answer the question whether the animal evidence for hypothermia and TBI really are compelling, and possibly what a good next step in this research area would be. Now I just have some concluding remarks, and if you remember these few things after this talk, I'd be pretty happy. So, animal to human translation is tough, but there are means of improving translation rate, and we believe that systematic review and meta-analysis of animal studies might be one way to assess this. And systematic reviews and meta-analysis of animal models can be used in multiple settings to answer a lot of different questions. And so that's all. Thank you.